Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which has been hosted by AHGB Beef and Lamb. My name is Chloe McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb within AHGB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on reducing lameness with consideration of appropriate antibiotic use. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Fiona Lovett from Flock Health Limited. Fiona has worked as a farm animal vet in practice for many years and set up Flock Health Limited, working as a consultant for four years. The plan of action is that Fiona will run through a presentation and there will be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screens. I will then ask Fiona your questions at the end of the presentation. We have over 200 people registered for the webinar this evening. Hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties, but please bear with us if there are any. So without further delay, I will hand over to Fiona. Okay, thanks Chloe. Um, evening everyone. Right, we're talking about lameness and especially thinking about antibiotic use. And the reason we're particularly thinking about antibiotic use is um, this graph here is taken from a paper um, that um, Piers led on that we um, published a year or two, a year back. And it basically looked at use of antibiotic in sheep only flocks. And the black bit at the bottom of each of those bars is oxytetracycline. And you can see it's, it's pretty much consistent right through the year. Um, and predominantly, I think most of you will agree um, that's used in, in the treatment of lameness. Obviously, we've got the two spikes in February and March um, related to antibiotics purchased um, prior to lambing. Um, but that consistent use of oxytetracycline through the year is mainly lameness. And it's estimated that approximately a third of antibiotics used in sheep flocks in the UK is used for lameness. Um, and, but there is a bit of confusion about this. And it's not, um, I often have farmers saying to me, how come you're telling us on one hand to avoid using antibiotics where necessary, um, but on the other hand, the message is to inject lame use. And I, I'm sure you'll agree, a lot of um, farmers have not historically used anti injectable antibiotics to treat lame use. Um, but we are saying that is um, best practice advice. Um, obviously, we'll go into this in more detail as we go on through the webinar. So what is this mismatch? And the answer is, obviously, a clinically lame sheep, a sheep with a bacterial condition, should be treated with an antibiotic in exactly the same way that if you had a septic finger or a bacterial infection, you would expect to get antibiotics to treat that bacterial infection. And that's absolutely right. Um, what a lot of the focus is of this webinar and a lot of the work we're doing um, through rumour and um, within, within the sheep industry is actually we need to prevent sheep becoming lame in the first place so that we don't have a lot of clinical cases, so that we don't have to use a lot of antibiotics. If we do have, if we do have a lot of clinical cases, we absolutely do need to treat those with antibiotics. Um, but, but the whole key is plan ahead, prevent infection and protect the flock so that we don't have to be just treating clinical cases. So, and it goes back and some of you will see me present this um, slide before, but when you look down at flock accounts, people concentrate on the vet and med costs, okay? And what we lump into there are two very different types of costs. And we've got what I would call bad vet spend. Bad vet spend is, is any money that you spend, the farmer spends, on treatment of animals, on um, uh, treatments because of loss of production, because the cost of disease. If you have a dead sheep and you get the vet in, that is a bad vet spend. That's, that's an uh, illness, a disease that is on your farm that you have to treat. Um, and all those costs we need to be avoiding as much as possible in our, in our whole farm economy. To, pre to prevent that bad vet spend, we need to invest wisely in good vet spend, i.e. we need to be spending the money on preventative measures. Um, we need to be planning ahead. We need to be protecting our flock. And I would so I would put any sort of vaccination or any preventative measure, for example, um, using CLIP to prevent um, fly strike, anything that's preventative goes in good vet spend because it's an investment that protects the flock against illness, um, disease, 
poor performance due, you know, due to disease, which would then incur bad vet spend. So, um, and the more we can separate these two costs, um, the better. And so I'll be, be coming back to that um, as I go through and consider lameness. So often, and I initially wrote this slide thinking of the vets in the audience, um, from a vet's point of view, Pharma phones up the practice, says, can I have another bottle, a couple of bottles of Octet? I've got a lot of lame sheep. That's the trigger. Now, it might be the farmer, farmer arriving at the vet practice. He's on the phone. He wants more antibiotics for his lame sheep. It might be that there's a report of, you know, too many lame sheep. That might be trading standards. It might just be a member of the public, somebody walking on the footpath saying, oh, I saw a lot of lame sheep in that field. Um, that might be the trigger. It might be that... Um, the vets are, are tracking their antibiotic sales and they um, notice that, you know, Fred Bloggs has suddenly got, um, has suddenly bought several bottles of oxytetracycline and, um, and it's that that triggers a practice to think, hang on, we've got an issue here. It might just be, and it, and it happens to me locally, driving past fields and thinking, crumbs, there's a lot of lame sheep in there. You know, is, is that the trigger? Should, should I be on the phone to that person saying, you know, can I give you a hand? Can we, can we sort this out? What's crucial for any vets I've got in the audience is that, is that we need to be turning that trigger into a useful interaction with the farm and we need to get measurable outcomes from that interaction. So um, those measurable outcomes could be improved contact with a vet and interaction on the farm. So we've actually got a proactive, useful um, relationship that actually can tackle the issue. Um, and as the vet is, is um, working alongside the farmer and dealing with something that's um, arguably fairly a simple issue of tackling lameness and obviously we can debate that because a huge number of people have huge issues with lameness. Um, we know it's something and the whole webinar is about it. We can get, we can definitely get on target with and get measurable outcomes, particularly when we Please just bear with us a second. I'll just try and find out where Fiona's gone. Hi everybody, sorry I think we're just having a technical difficulty at the moment, if you could please bear with us for a second. So we're on that farm, um, particularly looking at seasonal trends, hygiene, housing, um, handling areas. And we also need to be able to apply farm specific control measures. So I'll now go into each of those in turn. Um, but consider that I would I would always like to actually visit a farm, and I think that is essential for each implement, implementation of each stages of the plan. Correct diagnosis. There, there isn't just one cause of lameness in feet. Um, so here I've got the six main causes. Um, certainly, scald and foot rot is generally considered as much the same um, condition now. So scald in adult sheep with almost all. Sorry, guys, if you can just bear with us again, I will try and get hold of Fiona.
okay i'm uh and now it now says my audio's restored do you want me to change to a phone carry on on the computer Apo apologies everyone um apparently the audio wasn't working Can, can you hear me now, Chloe? Yeah, we can hear you again now, Fiona. I can hear you. Okay, shall I just carry on? Yeah, if you can carry on again, if we have the problem again, we'll get you to phone in and, and I, I can move the slides my end. Okay, I'll carry on. Apologies, everyone. I don't know how much was lost there. Um, okay, I was talking about... Um, Foot rot and CODD, and when you get those two together, you, you get quite severe um, lameness, and they will work synergistically to make it particularly bad. I'm not in this webinar going to talk about toe granulomas, foot abscesses, or shelly hoof. Um, suffice to say, they all cause lameness in sheep um, in uh, for, uh, different proportions in different flocks, um, and um, and really that's a subject of a whole other webinar. Um, for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk about the primary causes of infectious foot rot, uh, infectious lameness in UK sheep flocks, and primarily that's foot rot and often with CODD as well. So correct diagnosis is essential. Um, my presentation will not, will not move forward now. Um, apologies. Okay, the next for, for planning, um, and we will refer to the five point plan. It's an industry recognized um, standard way to approach control of lameness in the UK. It was developed originally for foot rot, um, but we also use it um, for CODD and foot rot quite successfully. Um, I will go through each one in, in detail, but we need to avoid the spread of infection. We need to treat individual clinical cases quickly and effectively. We need to quarantine 14 sheep, cull out any persistently affected, uh, affected sheep, and consider vaccination the flock to protect them against foot rot. And each of these areas of the five point plan, we need to consider those as we cover both a risk assessment for, for infectious lameness and control on the farm. But we absolutely need to be smart with each of those actions. So being smart for each individual farm needs to be specific um, with, with both the risk assessment and the action. We need to take measurable steps that are achievable for that farm within a realistic time frame. So within the context of that, I just want to refer to these lameness control planners which um, MSD Animal Health have produced, and they're an excellent resource. And I would thoroughly recommend anyone dealing with lameness, go into your vet practice, talk to your merchants. A, a, a huge number of both vets and merchants um, have been to training sessions about you know, going through um, this lameness control planner. It's very useful, extremely useful, um, and you can use it generically for any farm. Um, Actually, for your individual farm, I would prefer a, a smart action, so something that's actually specific for your farm. So when we when we go through um, the lanes control planners with, with different farmers, um, we always find there are some areas that people really need to focus on. Every single farm is unique, and, and that's what I mean about being smart, that um, one person um, won't have the same lameness issues as somebody else and there might be areas which are really unique to your own farm and that's that's why we do actually have to concentrate specifically on achievable outcomes for that particular farm um, but as a background or generically the lameness control planners are, are a great resource um, so so i've discussed planning and i'm going on to prevent and preventing is reducing the bacterial challenge on, on any farm. So we want to avoid the spread on the farm. Avoid is one of the five point one of the five points in the plan. 
We also want to prevent a buildup of bacteria by avoiding bringing on novel strains of Dicylobacter or CODD. Um, and for that, we especially need to be thinking about quarantine. And the third um, way we can prevent a buildup of bacterial um, infection is to remove clinical cases that happen quickly, treat them rapidly, preferably isolate them for the rest of the block and cull persistently infected ones. And as before, I will go into each one of these in detail. So avoid the spread um, as and a primary way to prevent a buildup of bacterial challenge. If you consider this sheep here on the right of this photo, this is taken from my house, looking down at my neighbor's sheep. The sheep on the right is lame. It's a sheep, it wants to walk through that gate and it follows this sheep path. And as it goes, it drops by Helobacter and Trepanines along the sheep path. This sheep over here on the left of the picture is currently sound, but it wants to go through the same gate and it's a sheep. So it follows the same sheep path. And as it does, it picks up Dicylobacter and Trepanines. And likewise, for this same sheep over here, this other sheep over here on the left hand side of the picture, also was sound, also wants to go through that gate, and also follows the same sheep path. And you can very quickly see how this blue lame sheep nicely contaminated the sheep path with the bacteria. And both these two sound sheep picked up the back the bugs as they travel through that gate. Every one of these lame sheep is a primary source of infection. So if we can isolate them and promptly treat them and cull the ones that are persistently infected, we will dramatically reduce the on-farm bacterial challenge. So um, that particular gate um, is not particularly wet and muddy. It was, that was a, you know, uh, taken in uh, it wasn't particularly wet at that time and the gate wasn't particularly um, uh, bad, but it is a high traffic area. So we need to consider wet, muddy, soiled areas anywhere we have a high traffic of, of sheep that can be in gateways, that could be around troughs. We also need to consider handling facilities, um, particularly when we gather the, where the sheep we need to be thinking about our hands as we examine named sheep. Our, our hands or the equipment we're using can transfer um, bacteria and um, chickenings from, from one foot to another. So um, reducing, avoiding that spread will reduce bacterial challenge. One of the ways we can do that is separating out the lame sheep and separating out sheep with lesions. We can foot bath the clean group. Any foot bathing is only as good as the facilities. So it's helpful to have the feet clean before their foot bath. It's helpful to stand them on a hard surface after foot bathing and absolutely follow the instructions of the products because they are all different. Now, good foot bathing is useful to treat lambs with scald. And it's also useful to prevent the spread between ewes once they're handled. It's important that foot bathing by itself is not an effective treatment for clinical cases of foot rot or CODD. In other words, if you've got lifting of the hoof, you've actually got underrunning of the hoof, then foot bathing alone is not an effective treatment. For those cases, you should use an injectable antibiotic. It's also worth just pointing out at this stage that it is no longer considered acceptable to use antibiotic foot baths for control of lameness in sheep. So um, there are um, we need to be looking at other we need to be looking at other ways to control particularly CODD which is when people did used to use antibiotic foot bars. Um, the reason we don't consider it acceptable is because well a we know it is quite possible to control lameness without an antibiotic foot bath it's, there are other methods that we can use. We also know that antibiotic foot bars use an enormous amount of antibiotics very high quantity of antibiotics and we also know that there is no acceptable way to dispose of those foot bars of antibiotics you know flushing down the drain putting it out in the environment is potentially um, really poor um, in terms of spreading anti antibacterial um, antibiotic resistance um, so um, 
please bear that in mind. Um, don't expect your vet to prescribe antibiotic foot baths um, because that is no longer acceptable. Um, so still talking about preventative, um, preventing um, on-farm bacterial challenge. One of the things we need to be doing is quarantine all of arrivals. Now, we know that um, we, not every farm has CODD. Um, there are probably, depending on where you are in the country, up to 40-50% um, of farms have not got CODD, um, but they, they're likely to get it by buying it in, buying it in on um, sheep that they, they bring onto the farm. And even if you have already got CODD, um, you don't have every strain of foot rot. You, um, and so you might you don't want to buy in sheep that have a more virulent strain of foot rot than that that your sheep are already um, used to. Um, and either buying in CODD when you haven't already got it or a different virulent strain of foot rot can cause enormous issues in your own flock. So there are a couple of things we need to do. Buy, know where you're buying them. Never, ever buy lame sheep. Um, um, but also just quarantine the ones you have bought in for a good three weeks to make sure you can pick up any that go lame in that time. I personally would check every foot before I let them into the flock. I don't want to have any um, sheep with lesions go into the flock um, because they may not be lame, but they, they might be spreading bacteria. Um, I like to foot bath them during quarantine. It's a hygiene measure. Um, I'd certainly, if any of them in quarantine did go lame, I would get onto them and treat them properly and be absolutely sure they were fully, fully recovered before they went into the flock. Um, and if I, my sheep, my own flock were vaccinated, I would want to be vaccinating those that I were buying in. I, I would want to do absolutely everything I can to make sure I'm not bringing in um, either CODD or foot rot into the farm to prevent that increase in challenge for my own flock. And then any clinical case, um, as I said in previous slides, any clinical case on the, on the farm is a primary source of bacteria to increase the challenge on the farm. And the current advice is that they should be treated as soon as possible. So even a mild case of lameness should be treated, um, even what you might think that isn't yet under running the horn in an adult sheep, actually the advice is to still treat those with an injectable antibiotic. Um, so I would spray them, I'd use a topical antibiotic, spray it, let it dry, spray it again, and that helps prevent the, the um, bacteria on the surface and the spread of bacteria. But I would also want to give an injectable antibiotic. Now the antibiotic you use on a sheep is entirely, um, it's prescribed by your own vet, and it's entirely up to your vet which antibiotics they prescribe for your flock. That needs to be a conversation with you and your own vet. So a lot of people will use one of the Oxtetch cycling type antibiotics, for example, alamycin, endomycin, any of the Oxtetch cycling is sort of orangey colored antibiotics. And for Dicylobacter, um, that they will work very effectively. They will not always work for CODD. So in some cases, we do have treponines that are sensitive to oxytetracycline, but not in every case. Now, they've done a lot of work on CODD at Liverpool, and in all the, um, all the, the work from there, they, they will use a lot, a lot of the um, papers that they produce from Liverpool, and they're using an amoxicillin type. So, for example, amoxicillin LA, beta mox LA, a long-acting amoxicillin um, to treat CODD um, in sheep um, quite effectively. Um, there is also the possibility that your vet may, pres may prescribe um, one of these macrolides, Azactran or Draxin. Now those are now licensed for sheep for the treatment of foot rot. There is nothing actually licensed for the treatment of CODD, but we do tend to use these macrolides when we have a CODD issue because they're fairly long, they have a long duration of action, um, and it makes it easier to manage a problem by using one of those long acting ones. Ideally, I would suggest we use um, antibiotics on this side of the screen to the left of the screen as much as possible. 
Um, but if we've got CODD that we can't control with an oxytetracycline, and as I said, that's 50-50, that's um, and it depends on different areas, different strains of CODD, whether, whether an oxytetracycline will work, then we can use namoxicillin, and that would be my drug of choice. In some circumstances where it's not possible to, um, for whatever reason, um, for practical management reasons, it may be that your vet will prescribe a macrolide, but it's entirely a conversation that you have with your own um, vet. Um, anything that's treated needs to be marked and recorded. You need to know how often you're treating it. And the current advice is that it is not advisable to, to trim lame sheep, that actually that will delay healing. It's important to treat them with an antibiotic, it's, and it's important to, to, to not trim or avoid trimming as much as possible. So now I'm going on to the third point. So it's plan, protect, plan, prevent and protect. And we protect the flock to increase resilience to lameness. And there's two elements particularly to protect. And one is that in our breeding programmes, we can breed sheep that are more resilient to lameness. And that partly can be achieved by culling out persistently lame ones, or at least not breeding from sheep that are, are lame. Um, so if you've got decent records and you know which sheep have been lame, you don't want to be keeping that animal as a breeding animal and you don't really want to be keeping her daughters as well. So um, foot Ross isn't hugely heritable. So in a group of large group of texels, um, it's about approximately 20% heritability. So um, it's not um, it's not guaranteed that a sheep that gets lamed to um, foot rot that all her daughters will also be lamed to foot rot. It's not hugely explained by genetics, but about 20% is ex is explained um, by the genetics. So we can um, help breed lameness resilient into our flock, and that is can be an important factor if you're breeding your own replacements that can be relevant and can help protect your flock. And the other major way we can protect our flock is to consider vaccination. So in the UK, um, we have one vaccine that is licensed to um, against foot rot, and that's uh, called Footvax, which it's, uh, it's a multivalent vaccine. It contains all the strains of the UK foot rot. Um, it, it's not the, the, only, the only thing that works. I couldn't promise anyone that all they had to do was vaccinate and that's the end of their problems, um, not by any means, but as part of a total control package, it can be useful. So um, what do we know about vaccination UK flock? Um, we know that last year approximately 16% of sheep eligible for foot rot were, were given foot back, so um, it's not, there's large numbers of sheep that are, that are not vaccinated. Um, but we do know that it can be very useful. Um, so similar, um, a study back in 2015 um, from Warwick, where they uh, looked at a large number of English um, sheep farms. And once again, they found approximately 16% were using that foot vax. Um, and they showed in their data that it was vaccination was responsible for a 20% reduction in the prevalence of lameness on those flocks and the flocks that used it. In, in another trial um, in, that they did at Liverpool on this group of 748 lambs, a lambs affected by both CODD and foot rot, they could look at vaccine efficacy. And they showed that the vaccine was 62% efficacious against foot rot. Um, and interestingly, it was also had some degree of efficacy against CODD. Now there's not CODD in the foot rot vaccine, there's only foot rot in there. Uh, but I don't think those results are, are that surprising because of what I said right at the beginning. We see a lot of synergy between Dicinobacter causing foot rot and treponines causing CODD. They work together and one disease makes the other one much worse. The, the two diseases together, you get much worse lameness. As one disease has sort of um, maybe broken the defences of the foot, um, the other disease can get a hold. So um, my feeling um, that, that is that once you control foot rot due to vaccination, that the effects of CODD are less. 
um, certainly from a clinical perspective, um, the um, a number of comments from farmers at workshops or in meetings is um, uh, anecdotally, farmers have found the vaccine hugely helpful um, in reducing levels of lameness. So it's, an, it's a tool in the box and it's very helpful in helping people get on top of it. So um, there's not many times I've heard cheap farmers say that something could cost twice as much as it does, but I have heard them say that about foot bags on a number of occasions. Each time I wish I had a video camera because um, no one would believe it if I said it, but um, you know, people who do find the vaccine can be very helpful as they, they've used it to help them control um, lameness to an extent, they've got on top of it and managed to make it more achievable. Um, just controlling lameness. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's worth, it's definitely worth considering. Um, when we've looked at uh, modeling, computer modeling of the costs of um, foot rot, I, I would suggest that the sort of break even for whether it's worth vaccinating or not depends on whether you've got more than 2% of your flock um, affected with foot rot. If more than 2% of the flock are lame with foot rot, then um, computer modelling would suggest there is a cost benefit to using um, foot backs twice a year. Um, but the use of foot backs is something that you very definitely should be discussing um, with your vet. And it, and it may be that it has a place, um, uh, it may be that it has a place in controlling lameness on, on your, your farm. So what do we do if we've currently got high levels of lameness on a farm? And this picture on the left, um, this field of a flock of sheep, the white sheep are sound ewes and they have no lesions. The slightly green ones are sound ewes, but they have got foot rot lesions. The slightly blue one, this is a ewe who's lame with scald. The purple one is a ewe lame with foot rot. In other words, she's got under running and um, lifting of the hoof. The orange ewe is lame with CODD. And the red ewe is lame with a chronic mixed infection, foot rot, CODD, um, but it's gone on a long time. And in general, as we go down this scale, we've got an increasing severity of lameness. Anyone who says they catch and treat lame sheep is more likely to be treating the more severely lame ewes, so the ones on the further right. Um, and certainly um, the, the literature shows that farmers, even if they do treat lame sheep, they are less likely to be treating a ewe that's lame with scald. The advice is to treat these ewes, and the reason the advice is to treat those is because it's the ewes who appear to be lame with scald that are potentially shedding higher levels of Dipylobacter. So there's evidence to show that a ewe that doesn't yet have underrunning of the hoof has very high levels of Dipylobacter there, um, and so she's quite a major source of infection. To the rest of the flock. So what would you do with this flock? Ideally you would separate out the lame sheep, isolate the lame sheep in what we can call your croc flock and leave your sound sheep in your main flock. Now if you're also able to examine all your sound sheep and remove all the ones with lesions into your croc flock, so much the better. If you can have all your sheep that have lesions in your crop flock, those are the ones to be treated. Your sound sheep now we have um, little bacterial challenge in this flock because we did in this sound flock because we no longer have um, bacteria in that flock. And then we can use a traffic light system which I'll have to attribute to Emily down in Synergy Farm Vet. Um, the traffic light system is that sheep can only move out of the red crop flock into an amber quarantine group. So they're treated in the crop flock and all the sheep in the crop flock are treated and they move into an amber flock where they remain for three weeks to ensure that they have properly resolved before they go back into the um, sound flock. If they've been in the crop flock 
and they've been treated two or three times um, with an effective antibiotic and they have not recovered, then they should be culled. But the um, traffic light system uses this amber flock as a part way house before they go back into the into the sound flock. If you're not able to create a clock flock, and there are times of year where you can um, more usefully, and actually in the run up to tapping, um, this is um, if you've not yet put the taps out, um, anyone who's um, you know lambing much later, a cock flock is a um, pre-tapping is a good time to um, pull out a cock flock. But if you can't do that, then it's even more important that you follow all areas of five point plan meticulously. So that means considering every lame sheep is a primary source of infection. So isolate them, promptly treat them, and cull them when necessary. Cull them when you've when you've had um, when they've been treated two or three times and they haven't cleared up. And the other important thing is to protect the flock, and and that ideally by by vaccination. And the the reason that can work is it by increasing the margin of safety. So there are, there are occasions where your defences fall down. So either something went wrong with quarantine and you bought in sheep, you maybe didn't have time to check more for lesions or the sheep sort of snuck into the flock that actually brought in um, a novel strain of um, Dicilobacter you didn't realise. Perhaps you're away for a week and you didn't get to treat clinical cases. Where any breach in defences there, then you... If your flock is vaccinated, there's, you've, you've got a bit more of a margin of safety before you actually go back to the trigger of actually there's too many lame sheep in this flock. Um, but if you if you do have high levels of lameness at the moment, um, and that would be anything more than 5% of the flock, I would definitely consider creating a cock flock. Um, it may be as you house them, um, you know, in as, as a run up to um lambing if you bring them all in um for housing um that can be a good time to have a section of the shed that is your crop flock if you've moved your lame sheep out as your housing that can be extremely helpful in not allowing lameness to get out of control when your sheep are housed um in the right pregnancy and then this um this is just about my final slide but if you any anyone who's really serious about tacking lameness Absolutely, you can get on top of it and uh, you know work with flocks who are easily um, less than one percent of the flock are lame at any one time, and they've got it well under control. Um, but we know nationwide there are flocks. Um, I've certainly visited flocks where they might have thirty-five percent of the flock lame um, at the time of the visit. Really, quite shockingly high numbers. Wherever you are on that on that um, scale, you. You can sort it out, but you need to get onto it. So I would always encourage the vets to visit in the first place, sort out the diagnosis. You know, not all lameness is the same, and you need to know what you're dealing with. You need to assess all the risk factors for the farm and design smart, specific, measurable, achievable um, control measures within a realistic time frame. And the other reason for getting a vet involved is to encourage you, and it is absolutely possible to get your lameness levels right, right down. Um, but you need to be focused and, and um, working with your vet on, alongside. Um, I would always actually encourage the vets to come to go back a week or two later to see how, it, how it's going. That first lot of, of treatment has gone. Um, the impact of that, you, you, you know, it's not all going to happen overnight, um, but uh, Getting, you know, quite concentrated in the first couple of weeks is very important. Um, I would encourage vets to, to be back in contact a month later to work out how things are going. What's, what is working? What needs rethinking? Once again, being smart about it, being specific, measuring it, applicable to that farm and making sure it's realistic. And then obviously there are some times of year which are better or worse than others. And continued follow up right through the year is, is really really helpful. Um, so we've, we've talked about all those three areas, planning, preventing, um, preventing animals getting infected and protecting them um, from doing so. Have we got any questions? 
Thanks, Fiona. Uh, while I'm waiting for some questions to come up, I would like to remind you all that the presentation has been recorded and will be able to, available to watch back on the AHDB YouTube channels, along with other previous webinars from AHDB Beef and Lamb. For vets listening, if you would like presentations developed by, by Fiona to deliver meetings to your clients, please email brp at ahdb.org.uk. So the first question is, we have a problem with CODD, which, which antibiotic injection should we use? How about foot bathing with antibiotics? And does foot vax have any effect on CODD? Right. Uh <laughs> And those might I, I I think I covered all three of those in the um, in the webinar, but um, I um, apologise because apparently I did keep fading out. So um, uh, first thing, which antibiotic to use in the first instance? Well, talk with your vet about it because vets are usually well aware of which antibiotics are effective in their areas, and certainly on 50% of the farms, an oxytetracycline will work quite fine for CODD, um, and that. That is your first to use um, in the first instance. It may be that CODD, it's not effective CODD on your flock, the strains of CODD you have there, and your vet might um, suggest you move on to something else. Um, and I spoke about possibility of using an amoxicillin or possibly a macrolide Draxin or Zactran. That's entirely the conversation for you to have with your own um, vet. Um, will foot back to work CODD? Not specifically, but it will indirectly, because um, we know that CODD is worse where foot rot is bad. So um, I have seen situations where CGD, CODD is a major issue and people have been disappointed with foot facts. And I've equally seen other farm situations where CODD is a primary issue, but they've undertaken foot facts in the flock and had massive, it's made a massive difference because actually the foot rot was a prime was was causing issues and allowing cdd to get to to find hold so um it's there's not a simple answer to that um it, but but if if there's an element and a significant element of foot rot involved as well vaccination can certainly make a difference and i can't remember what the third one was there sorry have i um, answered those questions Chloe? all right i think you have thank you fiona okay um, how long does foot rot survive on pasture and does rotational grazing, is it effective for breaking the cycle? OK, now we always spoke, used to speak about foot rot uh, surviving on pastures for about a week to 10 days. Um, actually, I think uh, and, and to some degree that's true, although some recent research has shown um, the foot rot, Dachylobacter can survive on um, the equivalent to pastures for, for significantly longer than that. I actually think that's slightly a red herring because the issue is not so much contamination from the pasture, but it's actually contamination from contemporaries within the group that are that have got that are shedding bacteria. That's so much more significant. Um, if there's a animal there that is in fact that has to, that has tequilobacter on their feet. Um, that is massively more important than how long it will survive on the, the pasture. So it's kind of right to consider it to a degree. Um, I, I, I don't think rotational grazing, if, if, if you manage to always pull out your sheep with legions very, very quickly, then you could start considering pasture. But if there's any animal in a group with a lesion, that absolutely is much more important than whether you know your rotational grazing or length of rotation or anything like that. Uh, thank you, Fiona. So following on from that, if you have muddy gateways and tracks, would the bacteria last longer or? Um, yes, and there's things, um, one of the things you can do is actually raising the pH. So lining can make a difference um, and, you know, it, drying out. So in, in Australia, they have transmission free period so when it's really dry hot and dry um particularly the dryness they have foot rot dicelobacter will not spread in those conditions we know and um, research has been done we know in the uk we do not have um transmission free periods although the drought this summer in some areas will have significantly reduced um will have made a difference it, it 
generally in the UK, we don't have transmission free periods. But those um, any wet muddy gateways and, and as we all know, generally that's the norm in the UK, we can improve it by um, by lining those areas because it raises the pH and um, the bacteria don't survive so well um, in an alkaline environment. Um, so you've mentioned foot bathing in quarantine. Um, so no antibiotics in the foot bath. Is that um, correct? No. So yes, that was the third one I forgot. So the current advice is um, uh, the the which is not advisable from a use of antibiotic point of view to be putting antibiotics in the foot bath. So um, a because the data the the evidence is not i know there's a lot of anecdotal evidence um but we also have people who are controlling cdg and foot rot quite well without using antibiotic foot baths so um the reason we we don't like antibiotic foot baths is because of the the larger quantities of antibiotics and the there is no acceptable way to dispose of that antibiotics without it going into the environment which is a huge risk for the development of antibiotic resistance and do you have any suggestions for the best foot bath for scold, zinc sulfate, or do you have anything better that you would suggest? Um, so actually, I was just, we've got a PhD looking at um, foot bathing at the moment. I was talking to her just an hour before this webinar. Um, and so we're, research, we're doing research at the moment. There are, um, there are a number of different options. Um, glutaraldehyde is actually, um, what the PhD is currently looking at, and I know people have found success with um, glutaraldehyde. Uh, people use forming in at 3% and walking through, although um, there's uh, always issues, potential human health issues with use of formulin. Zinc sulfate, and there's, pl there's papers from Australia which showed extremely good effects of zinc sulfate. Generally, you have to stand them in, so there's not many zinc sulfate solutions where you can just walk through and um, so you need to have a, a foot bath that's, that is standing um, for using zinc. There are other options for adding to that. Um, sort of a, an organic acid can add to the zinc and prolong the, the life of the zinc. All those are possibilities. The key is follow the instructions on the packet really clearly. Thank you. Um, could you please give a guide as to a good benchmark figure for antibiotic use for foot rot control on a per head or per weight basis? Um, so a guide for farm, uh, that's just, just say the question again. Um, a guide as to a good benchmark figure for antibiotic use for foot rot control on a per head or a per weight basis. OK, well, I can talk about, so um, in terms of on a weight, in terms of mix per PCU, which is a common metric that we use for antibiotic usage, on a farm basis, we're looking at averages of, of just around 5 to 10 mix per PCU on, on sheep farms. So I would, I would like farms to be um, around that 10, 10 mix per PCU or less. Um, a farm that's poorly controlled foot rot um, or CDD or lameness in general um, is likely to have a higher usage level um, and and really needs to be using other other methods. But um, you need to be aiming well below the 10 mix per PCU and that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts of using mycotill for CODD? Yes, so um, mycotil is a uh, macrolide, so I, I should have put that on my picture of all the slides. So it's in the same class as Draxin and Zactran. Um, it's a vet only product, so you can't use it. Um, we're not allowed to leave it on farms. Um, personally, I think it's a great antibiotic. It works really effectively um, in control of um, foot rot and CODD. Um, I did some of the trial work comparing. Uh, when they were getting the license for Draxin um, and we were comparing it to Mycotil, so sort of uh, whether it was working as effectively. Um, yeah, I, I really like uh, Mycotil. Um, it's, we 
we're not allowed to leave it on farm, so it is a vet only. But it works well, it's got a good duration of action. Uh, and the next question is, how do you recommend treating a raised hoof that has been broken away from the foot if foot trimming is not recommended? Well, if, um, if that hoof is, every time the animal puts its foot down, the hoof is going to jab into a sensitive area, then I would, um, as carefully as possible, remove that hoof. In most cases, the majority of cases, um, the hoof, um, even though it's detached, it's not um, it's not causing further damage and actually it can be quite a nice protection on the really raw um, core in the really sore area of the hoof and I would prefer to leave that hoof there um, to to protect the animal we've got um, quite a lot of photographic evidence of lame sheep um, with uh, underrunning hoofs that have not been trimmed but as a sheep is as a sheep um, is treated effectively with an effective antibiotic and clears up the infection, the sheep will then walk it sound and the hoof will drop off naturally um, and, and I don't have an issue with that. I would only remove it if it, I felt it was actually jabbing in and causing more damage. Thank you Fiona. Um, another question, we have quite a problem with lameness in our lambs, especially when the creep feeders are put out despite using lime and moving them regularly. Would you recommend using foot vax for lambs or are the margins too tight? Now that's a very good question um, and generally people will use vaccination in their ewe flock um, and controlling uh, it in the ewe flock can help to, to prevent it in the lamb flock. However, I have equally come across cases where we've had we've been unable to control lameness in the lamb flock and on cost benefit we found that it, it was it, it, it was worth using the vaccine um, for the lambs and it made an, a really good difference um, it was really worth it um, so yeah it's approximately a pound a dose for vaccination but you know a, a lame lamb does not finish you can't market it and you don't want to be you know you don't want to be treating it um, with lost antibiotic although obviously if you've got a clinically lame lamb you do want to be treating with antibiotic you just need to be using something that's um, not got a very long withdrawal so um, I would prefer to use a vaccination in the ewe flock and control use all other methods first but I certainly have resorted to using it in the lamb fl um, flock and with, with really good results so um, there's no definite right or wrong there. Thank you. Um, if you make a crock flock before tupping, do you hold them back from the tup completely if it's taking several treatments to clear the ewes up? Um, you're, you're, we're, we're really talking about this slightly too late now <laughs> because <laughs> ideally I would have done that a month or two bad, back so I know that I've cleared them up and, um, and either, so by the time you get to the tub, We've either um, they've either been cold because we haven't cleared them up, or we've cleared them up effectively before they go to the tub. So appreciate now talking about this late stage. Um, we haven't got the benefit of of loads of time, but um, yeah, ideally get them sound first because they're they're you're going to have a higher barren rate and reduced training just the stress. You, you want them to be clear before they go to the tub in, in an ideal world. Thank you. Um, another question is, you have suggested culling persistently lame ewes, but often we have to keep these ewes for numerous weeks before they are sound enough um, to send them to auction, and even longer if antibiotics have been used and withdrawals completed. Is there a suitable alternative way to cull ewes while still lame in order to reduce the risk? Yeah, no, um, uh, and it is one of the big dilemmas we have. You, you cannot travel a lame sheep, so you have got to treat You've got to treat her, um, and if she's if she's persistently infected and the treatment's not working, then that's where you really want her to be isolated from the rest of your flock. Because in that time, you're waiting until either she's sound enough to travel, or your withdrawal has um, uh, uh, your withdrawal periods have gone out. You really want her to be on a sacrifice area of ground so she's not contaminating the rest of the flock. Yeah, it is a huge dilemma. 
but that's one reason why records are really, really important. Because if she goes, if, if you've treated her and she's gone sound, you may then um, f forget to get rid of her or, or go soft and keep her. And if she then goes lame again, you know, she's just, she's just an issue. So good records are really important, but also keeping away from the flock whilst you wait for her to be sound enough to go. But there's no, no, I don't have any magic um, uh, ideas for what to do with a lame sheep that you're trying to get rid of. You, you can't travel her. Um, and why is foot trimming no longer recommended? So a huge amount of research has been undertaken, primarily um, at Warwick. Um, but they, so in the first a lot of research, they showed that routinely trimming um, sound sheep just to, to, you know, as a keeping the toes um, lo looking tidy, actually led to more lameness in those flocks than flocks that did not routinely foot trim. And the more people routinely foot trim, the higher the levels of lameness generally. And then further work showed as they looked at uh, use lame use that uh, in a controlled trial, blinded trial, the um, the lame trimming a lame ewe delayed healing in those ewes. Is, there is quite convincing um, evidence. So, um, and there are some cases where you do need to trim, but you need to consider it as a cosmetic trim. The important thing is to treat the infection by using an effective antibiotic um, and the the trimming is not a treatment it's a cosmetic thing thanks fiona uh, what would you use to cleanse and disinfect handling facilities i would use something like um vercon um uh, yeah uh, a, a, a disinfectant you need to really you need to clean them we one of the trials I was involved in where we were photographing sheep comparing ones that had been trimmed and ones that hadn't been trimmed um, we were swabbing the trimmers and we managed to pick up the key, um, treponines the um, the coarse cod always pick it up on the on the trimmers even the one we we disinfected some of those trimmers and still I think it was something like 17 percent of the time we still picked up treponines after disinfection so they need to be really cleaned and effectively disinfected to be sure that you're not transmitting um, so uh, and work has also shown from from Liverpool that the transmitting it on gloves a any um, any hooves gloves any trimmings any of that uh, is infectious and will pass um, will pass the infection on um, and where do you stand on the use of lincospectin for treatment of foot rot or CODD um, so, uh, if, if the question is lincospectin in the foot bath, I'm afraid there is, uh, uh, I've, uh, I've already said it, it's not acceptable to use antibiotic foot baths. Uh, and I suppose the only thing I didn't say is, unless there are severe welfare issues. So in some cases, in the face of a severe outbreak, a vet might consider it necessary to um, I suppose throw everything at it and one of the apart from using injectable antibiotics use foot bathing but as a general routine control of CDD um, foot bathing is not appropriate. Um, so you've said to remove lame use from the flock how long should you leave the field before returning sound sheep to that field? At least I would say at least a fortnight um, but it's but the the main the, so we so yeah we know that Dikeela could arguably could survive for longer than that but realistically and practically ten days to ten days appears to be practically okay um, so yeah as long as possible and um, uh, and I wouldn't guarantee it was Dikeela back to free after 10 days to fortnight but practically speaking that's length of time I'd like to leave it. Thanks Fiona and um, just a couple more questions and then we'll be out of time. Are there any evidence to suggest that any breeds of sheep are more susceptible than others to, to lameness? Um, uh, yes well 
um, there's, there is definitely a genetic component. So we know there is a heritability um, approximately 20% in Texels, and that would be different for different breeds. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, anecdotally, people see differences um, between breeds. There's any, any genetic thing is then emphasized with breeds. So yes, the, the camp, the there definitely is difference in susceptibility. Um, and how many weeks prior to housing should you use foot vax? Prior, prior to housing, um, there's not, so it's not, there's not a specifically on the date sheet. You basically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry giving foot vax as they were housed, although you do need some time for the immunity to develop. Um, it depends. So that's a, a management um, thing as to whether you can, you know, give it a couple of weeks beforehand. It's more significant. You don't want to be giving foot backs um, a month either side of lambing, and you don't want to be giving it just prior to shearing because you can get some lumps um, with the vaccine. So, um, but actually, relevant to housing, um, it's less important. Thank you. Um, and are there any drugs that should be avoided close to and during tupping time? Um, not so. Certainly, uh, one of the antibiotics. Um, it, so there, there may be on specific antibiotics it may um, suggest. So, for example, new floor says don't give to to breeding um, rams. But um, in terms of evidence of antibiotics causing an issue with tapping. There is, there's no published um, evidence. I'd certainly say if you've got a lame animal um, with you know, an infectious cause of lameness, that's going to affect their um, conception rates in the ewes and, and um, sperm viability in the rams. Anything that's raised the temperature will have a much greater effect than the antibiotic you've used to cure it. So don't not give an antibiotic because you're worried about tapping much much more important to cure the infection and make sure they're right thanks fiona um last two questions what about the use of nsaids so an nsaid is an anti-inflammatory and foot rot is a painful condition and absolutely um it's to be recommended that you know that they you reduce pain as quickly as as possible so um, there's there's always good reasons to to give a non-steroidal um, a third anti um, an analgesic so painkiller. Um, there are not any NSIDs licensed in sheep, so we have to um, a vet has to prescribe it under the cascade. So cattle medicines um, that is quite possible, but everyone needs to understand they're not actually authorised in sheep. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, two quick questions. I think you might have covered them, but um, if a sheep's foot is severely overgrown, would you foot trim? If it was, if it was in such a way that I could see it was causing an issue with how they were walking, yes. If they're not, if they're not lame, no. I, I don't. Uh, it's, it's the overgrownness in itself is not an issue. Um, if it's if it's obviously causing gait issues, then I'll consider that. But I would absolutely be careful not to draw any blood. The uh, as a general rule, trim as little as possible. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, the last question, and then we'll be out of time. Does putting foot rot shears into neat formula and help stop spreading bacteria via the shears? Um. Probably, I'm not sure I want to be handling meat formula personally, but um, I would doubt they could survive that. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, general, as long as they're clean and scrubbed and general disinfected, I, I think I would be a bit cautious about meat formula from a um, human health perspective, apart from anything else. Okay, thank you very much, Fiona. Um, thank you for that brilliant presentation and thanks to everybody for listening. 
I would like to remind you that the presentation has been recorded and will be available on the AHDB YouTube channels, along with other previous webinars, should you want to revisit it. Um, the recording of this webinar will be emailed shortly in case you need to recap on anything heard tonight. Thanks again and have a good evening, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.